Hello, everybody, especially fellow science communicators. If we're watching this together, if you're watching this with me, I, you know, you're probably something, you're something adjacent to a science communicator. Um, uh, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. It's not required for this conversation. But um, I think a lot about science communication uh, on, um, on all sorts of different levels. Uh, having spent the, the last couple of decades of my life immersed in it, uh, and, you know, the previous decades leading up to that, just simply mansplaining out there in the world, um, I think about science communication and how we disseminate knowledge and how we pass on the things that we're interested in. Um, and these may sound like casual things, but... All real science is, is a codified version of the stories we all tell each other. It is a rigorous version of the stories we all tell each other. So like, you know, civilization begins where, I don't know, let's say there's a, let's say there's some sulfurous, sulfurous, sulfurous deposit somewhere that's leaching out of the ground and, uh, 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 you know, people living near this output of gas start to get ill. Uh, that is a occurrence, people getting ill, an association of that occurrence with uh, a proximity, i.e. there's a smoke at that occurrence that isn't at other occurrences and that might be making people ill. This is like how people, this is how all life protects itself, right? It takes in data, it makes some assessments. Some of this is autonomic, some of it is evolutionary, and some of it is totally conscious. But um, science is basically us telling each other stories, but under agreed upon and rigorous conditions. Science communication is also that, but uh, one of the issues with science in general is it requires, many branches of science require esoteric knowledge of terminologies and base methodologies and foundational philosophies in order to converse in that. So science communication is about bringing that, in my opinion, science communication is about bringing that into a vernacular and doing a couple of things. One thing is creating drama with scale. That's, I've talked about that before. I love talking about that. Uh, I love, you know, when we look at those photographs first from Hubble of the blank spots in the sky and find them filled with galaxies and now with James Webb Space Telescope where we're like, that times 10, that kind of scale and breadth, I'm getting goose pimples just talking about it. I love it. And one of the other ways that we communicate science to each other is by what I like to call physicalizing the science. And that's what Jamie and I did for most of, for our whole run. That's what Jamie, Jamie, Carrie, Grant, Tori, Jesse, uh, 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 Scotty, <laughs> Uh, and everybody else that contributed to Mythbusters. That's what we were doing. We were physicalizing your experience because we were going through it. We were your avatars for the experience. We were talking about how it felt, gross, sticky, funny, hot, whatever. But we're bringing it to a physical reality for you. Um, there's a tremendous book that came out when I was a kid called The Way Things Work by David McCullough. Um, and it is a... Uh, it was, I remember it being a kind of a sea change in um, what you'd call kids science communication. But wait, is it McCullough? Do I have that right? Hold on a second. David McCauley, David McCauley, McCauley. Sorry, we'll include a link to the way things work. Um, one of the beautiful things about the book is it expresses really complex scientific uh, ideas with beautiful, simple, easy to grasp illustrations. And the illustrative style is one that communicates depth and dimension, and thus you feel the objects that you are looking at. Can you believe I've got a four, a five minute preamble to this video to talk about one of my favorite science communicators, Theodore Gray. You might remember Theodore Gray as a man who burst out on the scene uh, uh, maybe 15 years ago with an amazing output called Elements. Um, 
that project began with the Theodore Gray just collecting small bits of every element that he could. It just was a, like a life goal. And then because he knew he was gathering something that was important to, uh, to science communication, he started chronicling his collection. And this is pre-digital photography, but he was surmising that there were going to be complicated and interesting things he wanted to do with his collection in the future. And so he kind of, he documented his collection and he future-proofed that documentation. Um, and by future-proofed, what I mean is he took high, he took high resolution film photographs, uh, rotating these objects at every, in every orientation so that when digital finally happened, he had all these incredible assets. And then at the beginning of digital, he was also chronicling at the highest resolution that he could. So Teo is a, is a believer in disseminating information to humans. He wants you to understand the world with the pleasure that he grasps it. Um, and Elements was a book. It was a, uh, there's, there are cards. I mean, I have many of its manifestations. At, years ago, full disclosure, uh, Jamie and I attempted to work on, make a TV show with Teo Gray. And because of the folks that we were negotiating with that were uh, our business partners at the time, I think that Teo might not, I know that Teo, this, sorry, I know that Theodore Gray does not have the highest opinion of how that negotiation went. And uh, for that, I am sorry. I was not in control of many aspects of it. Um, it does not diminish, I hope, uh, it does not diminish my admiration for the man whatsoever. And there was no issues that we had personally during those negotiations as we just weren't able to make a deal. Um, Teo Gray has a new book out and his publisher sent it to me. I, I keep saying Teo. I, his name is Theodore, and for some reason I'm thinking, th I, and it might be that I was introduced to him as Theo Gray, but I don't mean to nickname him into oblivion. Theodore Gray. This is the book. It's called Engines. And I think this is one of the more beautiful science books, uh, engineering books, that I have come across. Um, and that's why you got a seven and a half minute preamble to talking about this book, because Theodore Gray is... I, I, one of my favorite science communicators, and he's released this new book. Uh, the photographs are by Nick Mann. Um, Mr. Gray, you can ask me for a blurb next time you're doing a book. I will totally write you one. Um, let's get the camera up and just start pawing through this book, shall we? So, first of all, it's a lovely format. Second of all, look, I mean, just in our first page, actually, can I get a better? Okay. So, I just want to say right off the bat here, let's pull this so I don't harm it further. Like, right off the bat, this graphically makes me want to keep turning the pages. Engines, how they work, steam engines, internal combustion engines, electric motors beyond the engine. Multiple colors represented. It's really lovely. And this, an X-ray of a four-cylinder engine in the uh, mid-stroke, as it were. And here's the thing. I can see the milling marks on this, and I don't think that's by accident. I can see the 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 marks of manufacture on that, and for me, that always feels like it's a hug, like I am receiving some uh, a view, right? That's not normally given. This is like what the Exploratorium here in San Francisco does so well: is it shows the manufacture of its objects. And this is just a really, really simple steam engine with a counterbalanced cam here and a piston going on here. Um, oh, and so here's what I love about this: look, every single one of these things is not filmed and is not photographed in scale to each other, but photographed at a scale in which you can grok the object, in which you can see the details of the object. Um, I mean. 
just for reference, right? Like this is the size of a postage stamp and this is the size of uh, like, a, you know, a 20 foot cube van, um, at least, if not twice that size. Uh, so we start out with steam engines and we move through, we get uh, understanding of how they work, uh, how they work in common toys, how they have worked throughout history. Here is the anatomy of the stroke of a steam engine, talking about phases and harmonics. Um, this is, here's what makes this such a masterpiece to me. Um, What makes this such a masterpiece to me is that in the middle of not too much text, but enough to fill in the story, there are these pictures. And when you photograph stuff like this, at this dimension and this depth of field and this level of care and love of the object, your photography makes that object accessible to me and my brain. Um, we get to hydraulic motors. Um, I mean, this is this is a tremendous, you know, this might strike you as a kind of a lightweight science book. And in the depth it goes into, into each individual thing, certainly it is, you know, attacking past the surface, but not at, an, at, at a deep depth. You're not going to become an engineer just reading this. But you will, after reading this book, have a a pretty balanced understanding of locomotion and power and how the various things that run our world actually work. What, what more can you ask for from a tome that is not just informational, but also beautiful? And moreover, I would say that the beauty is part of what makes it so good at its information. Why is, why is David Attenborough like one, one of the most celebrated science communicators of the last several generations? I mean, it, you know, he kind of grabs the mantle from Carl Sagan. The main reason is beauty. The main reason is, is that, you know, while Attenborough wants to educate us about how to take care of our planet, he is also constantly showing us how gorgeous it is. And I really feel like Theodore Gray, uh, is, is doing the same thing. In taking beautiful photographs, he is ascribing an aesthetic value to knowledge to a certain extent. And I think that is really, I think there is an aesthetic value to knowledge. There are better ways to learn and deeper ways to understand stuff. You, uh, so, I cannot, I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, with every single picture, it illuminates, it gives perspective, it breeds knowledge. And again, as a science communicator, I don't think there are many higher order things that humans do than pass on what they know to subsequent generations. Um, Re the beauty of these photos and what photos and looking at stuff can teach you. Years ago, Jamie and I were doing a story in which Jamie was hydroforming some steel. I won't go into the details of hydroforming. Suffice to say that his first attempt did not work and he came and he got me and he said, I want you to come look at the piece of steel on the shop floor. And I came down and I looked at it and I was like, oh, it burst. And he said, yeah. And I was just staring at it. And while I was staring at it, I was thinking about why it burst, and I was thinking about small radii of corners and where steel would reach its uh, limits of the ability to stretch. And I came to this understanding of exactly why the problem had happened and how you could fix it. And I said, oh, 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 yeah, just you need to relieve those corners a little bit. Wow, I said, I understand more about steel right now than I did five minutes ago. And Jamie was like, I know, same thing happened to me. That's why I came and got you. That's what the power of looking at something and thinking critically about it can give you. And it is easy to look at things when they are photographed, when they're right in front of you, and also when they're photographed with a surpassing commitment to clarity and also beauty. Um, thank you, Theodore Gray, for writing, for continuing to uh, generate incredible science communication output. This is just, it's magnificent. Um, go get this, we'll include a link in the description below. Um, 
Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching that video. Your support allows us to make more of this great content. If you'd like to help us on a deeper level, even head over to tested-store.com because we've got stickers. Who doesn't love stickers? Our anime-inspired tested logo in Japanese. Follow the process, not the plan. It's not a process. It's not a problem to solve, it's a process to manage other aphorisms that have come from my mouth. Um, and we have just made a full set of our demerit badges in sticker form. So you can cover your toolbox with all of your screw-ups and celebrate it with other makers. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.